Um, my name is Lauren Bry, and I serve as the Director of Strategic Partnerships and Sustainability for Dairy Business Association and Edge Dairy Farmer Cooperative. As many of you know, DBA moves dairy forward in Wisconsin by connecting with our communities and policymakers through advocacy, collaboration, and continuous improvement. DBA focuses on state policy, speaking up for our dairy community. Our sister organization, Edge Dairy Farmer Cooperative, provides dairy farmers across the Midwest with a strong voice, the voice of milk, in Congress with customers in our communities. A strategic focus for both organizations is building strong relationships within the broader dairy community. One of these partnerships is with our dairy checkoff groups, including Dairy Farmers of Wisconsin. We value the work they do in promoting the delicious dairy products our farmers help create. Edge is proud to partner with them and to sponsor their presentation today. With that, I'm excited to introduce our moderator for our panel. Adam Brock is currently the Director of Food Safety, Quality, and Regulatory Compliance for Dairy Farmers of Wisconsin. His role entails working with Wisconsin dairy industry stakeholders to ensure the long-term viability of Wisconsin dairy in both domestic and international markets. Adam supports research, education, and initiatives in areas tied to applied research, food safety, quality, regulatory compliance, and sustainability. Adam is a 20-year veteran of the food industry. Prior to joining Dairy Farmers of Wisconsin, he held research and development, quality, manufacturing, and food safety roles with Papa John's International, Sargento Foods, Smithfield Foods, and several industry-leading analytical testing labs. So please help me in welcoming our panelists and our moderator, Adam Brock. Thank you, good morning. Everybody uh, make it in okay? No, no weather delays, I see. Um, <clears throat> so this morning, I wanna thank you for taking the time to come visit and attend this session. So as Lauren mentioned, my name is Adam Brock and I'll be the moderator. And we have a panel today. We're gonna to have three of our industry colleagues talk a little bit about secure milk supply. Um, and what I wanna do before we dive in, how many of you, quick show of hands, are on the producer side? So you own cows, yep. What about processors? All right, couple processors. Um, what if you're not either of those? Raise your hand. All right, we've got a good mix today. Awesome, so good discussion. All right, well, so to put some context, I'm gonna put up two slides. This is gonna be the shortest slideshow you've ever seen, okay? Today's discussion, but these two slides kind of hit home and provide context for the discussion. So, How many of you have seen this slide before? If you haven't, well, Lauren has, a couple others. So if you look at how dairy contributes to Wisconsin's economy, it contributes more than citrus in Florida and potatoes to Idaho. So you're looking at a $45.6 billion industry. When you look on Forbes and some other organizations, if you look at brand value, that's equivalent to a Toyota or a McDonald's in terms of brand value. So everything is within that context. It's well respected throughout the world and in the US. The other thing, oh, wow, a little louder. Everything we cover today, if you walk out of this room, I want you to remember securemilksupply.org on the website. Everything we're gonna talk about is tied to the website. There's resources, materials, and this will be up for the duration of our discussion, so there's no excuse for not remembering the website. So with that, I'm gonna move over to our speakers. So first is Becky Slater. Becky is the Emergency Response Coordinator for the Division of Animal Health, Wisconsin DATCAP. She coordinates secure food supply and foreign animal disease outbreak planning, training and response. She serves in the roles of both liaison officer, planning section chief of the DAH, incident management team, and she's also a member of the Wisconsin All Hazards Type 2 
Southwest All Hazards Regional Type 3 and Southwest DNR Forestry Type 3 IMTs. Okay, why don't you give us a, a wave, Becky, so everybody knows Becky. All right, next we have Dr. Darlene Conkle. She is the state veterinarian in the Wisconsin Department of Ag, Trade, and Consumer Protection. She received her doctorate of veterinary medicine degree from UW-Madison in 1993 and worked in both clinical, pra worked in clinical practice before joining DATCAP. Uh, Dr. Conkle oversees animal disease control programs and coordinates emergency response planning for foreign and emerging diseases of livestock and poultry. So, Dr. Conkle. And Mike Starkey. Mike has been with the Minnesota Department of Agriculture for 29 years and recently accepted the position of Director of the Office of Emergency Preparedness and Response. His main responsibilities have centered on collaborating with local, state, federal government and private industry in emergency preparedness and response planning for food and ag emergencies, particularly in the area of Minnesota's secure milk and pork supply programs. Pork supply programs. So with that, we'll kick off our questions. If you have questions, we will make this a discussion. I'm not going to lecture to you. Our group is not going to lecture to you. So I'll throw a couple questions out to our group, and then I'm going to open up the floor for additional questions. So let's start off. And we're going to start off with uh, Becky. So if you could explain secure milk supply in maybe two to three sentences, how would you describe what it is and why it was created. Secure milk supply. Secure milk supply, along with the other secure food supply planning um, documents and tools that we have, are really a business continuity tool. It's a business continuity plan. Um, the foundation of the planning is for the producer is biosecurity. Um, that's the key, proper biosecurity, enhanced biosecurity, and a disease outbreak um, greatly reduces the spread of disease, that which also equals reduced risk. Um, par other parts of secure milk include movement control so that we can monitor um, how animals and product are moving, again, to reduce the spread of uh, disease to uninfected premises. And the other key piece is surveillance. Keeping your eyes open. Okay. Uh, Dr. Conkle or Mike, do you have anything to add to that? So. Okay. So here's a quick poll. How many of you can stop your cows from producing milk? Yeah. So if we can't move milk, we've got a problem, right? <clears throat> so you've got to have that business continuity program. And you know, secure milk supply is that basic business continuity. So are there other programs, Becky, like this? There are. Um, in 2015, during the high path avian influenza outbreak, we utilized the secure egg and secure poultry plan very successfully. That was the first time we'd actually utilized one of these secure food supply plans in Wisconsin. Um, there's also secure beef and secure pork. Um, pretty aggressive on the front of secure pork in the last year or so with the threat of African swine fever that, um, moving more across to Asia, some other countries. All right. And then you mentioned African swine fever. So for dairy producers, what would be the biggest disease of concern and a little bit of history behind that? Dr. Conkle. So Becky talked about African swine fever a little bit, and that is an immediate threat because it is spreading through Asia. Um, I think the biggest threat to the dairy industry as far as a foreign animal disease threat would be foot and mouth disease. And I think many of you have probably heard of that disease. It has not existed in the United States since 1929 or in North America since the 50s uh, when it was um, still in Canada. But foot and mouth disease is what we call endemic, meaning it exists and it circulates in about two-thirds of the countries of the world, so two-thirds of the land mass, if you will, of the world, um, farmers and producers are still dealing with foot and mouth disease. And as we all know, the world's a, a smaller place and it keeps getting smaller um, year by year as, as there's more international travel, more movement of animals, and more movement of products, uh, even internationally. So the disease itself is um, pretty debilitating to cattle and really any cloven hoofed animal. So not only cattle are susceptible, but sheep and goats, swine, um, deer species, cervid species, 
and others. And it causes what we call vesicles, but they're blister-like lesions on the tongue and on the teats and on the feet of affected animals. And it's a virus. It does cause systemic illness as well, so fever. But just those blisters themselves, if you can imagine, cause erosions and ulcers on some pretty sensitive areas of the body, the, the tongue, the oral cavity, uh, and then the feet and the teeth. So these animals are not comfortable at all. In some cases, they're sloughing skin. They become debilitated. They obviously don't really want to eat. Uh, a lot of salivation and pain in the oral cavity. If the feet are affected, they are unwilling and in some cases unable to walk. So it is a humane issue. Um, interestingly, it doesn't really kill animals. It's not a fatal or a lethal disease. These animals can recover. But by the time they do, they're going to be uh, not, not a high producer anymore, and there's, and there's some debilitation that happens as well. So our concern with it is, obviously, that it is a foreign disease to the United States. A lot of our trade and our ability to market our animals and our products internationally um, hinges on the fact that we don't have it in the United States. So if it does manage to find it way, its way into the U.S., it's going to affect trade immediately. Um, and we mentioned, too, we mentioned movement of animals. There's a lot of that that, that still happens and more and more. As an animal health official, and I know my 49 plus other counterparts across the nation, our first tool when we discover a disease, an emerging disease or um, a foreign animal disease, is going to be to stop movement. And I know that's painful to an industry, but for us to, in order to find out how far it is spread, get a handle on where it might have come in and how many different areas might be affected. We need to stop movement of animals and products, at least initially, to figure out what we're even dealing with. Now, our goal with these secure food supply plans is to develop a continuity of business <coughs> plan to start releasing some of those holds just as quickly as we can to allow the industry to still maintain itself. And the plans, I guess I'm happy to say all of these secure food supply plans, and in particular the secure milk supply plan, they're based on science. They're based on, a, on risk assessments that were done by University of Minnesota and Iowa State University. So animal health officials like me have some confidence in the, the underpinnings of these plans that we can take those off the shelf if needed and, and start those working. And as Becky said, it did work back in 2015 with, with high path avian influenza. Both Mike and I are pretty familiar with that. We took those plans off the shelf and, and used them and, and later found out that they worked. They didn't spread disease. All right, perfect. But here's the big question that I think maybe some people have. Um, you know, we haven't, we've, we eradicated it in 1929. So, <laughs> Where, why, why the big concern? Why would a processor be interested in that, Mike? I'd love to take that one. <laughs> <laughs> um, give you a little story, a little background. Um, if you remember back in 2012, 2013, high path even influenza was circulating around China um, in the Far East. Um, and lo and behold, in 2014, it came to the United States in Washington. You know, kind of background, backyard flocky kind of stuff. I spoke with um, the um, really godfather of Minnesota poultry in Minnesota, um, University of uh, Minnesota um, um, professor, and he said, Mike, I've never, in the 39 years I've been working in the poultry industry, I've never seen high path avian influenza. Um, and another um, professor there said, you know, Mike, if we get it, we'll probably, you know, it'll take two years to make it over the, over the Rockies. Um, that, was two, that was November and December of 2014. We had it in Minnesota. We didn't know it yet, right? Because the first detect was February 28th of 2015. So here's a two professors that had never seen it before, and it was in Minnesota, um, and we didn't realize it yet. So that's why it's important um, that we plan for these events so that we understand um, the mechanics behind them. Yep. I would agree with that, Mike. And the more we can proactively develop plans and programs, we're in, better, we're in a better and state. If, and if I could even continue a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we, we went into that event both ignorant and naive, um, and they're two very dangerous places to be. Um, we had been working on Secure Egg for years. Um, the industry was really engaged. Um, also the turkey industry, 
and we were never so overwhelmed um, in High Path um, the first several weeks. Um, you maybe remember the news. Um, you know, we, we need to understand how animals move in, in states and how we can keep those animals and animal products moving in one of these events. And that's what the Secure Milk Supply, Secure Ports <laughs> with Poultry does. So assuming there was some sort of emerging animal disease, um, how would a producer proactively, like what are some of the benefits, I guess I'd say, of implementing a program? And I open this up to you all. Um, you know, that proactive approach. Well, I think a proactive approach just kind of in general gives a producer a leg up on, you know, that things like biosecurity and creating, I've heard it described as almost figuratively creating a moat around your farm to keep disease out. Um, so for foot and mouth disease, that, that would give you a leg up on if the disease does make its way into the United States. We in Wisconsin would be watching this really closely if it's in Canada, if it's in another state, even remotely, remote from, from us. Um, some of these biosecurity practices, and I really encourage everybody to take a look at the, white, the website. There's a lot of great tools there. You might think to yourself, well, we're never going to see foot and mouth disease in my lifetime. And you might be right. We all hope you are right. <laughs> uh, but these practices are good practices for a variety of disease prevention strategies. So just good biosecurity techniques that would keep your farm safe from a variety of pathogens. So if you're a producer and you've got a biosecurity plan in place, is that enough with a foreign animal disease outbreak? Is it enough to have a standard biosecurity plan in place? Or is there an opportunity to build on what you have with secure milk supply? Mike? Yeah, I, definitely. Um, you know, the basic biosecurity plan is good, but it won't be good enough in, for, in an FMD outbreak. Um, you know, the concepts are there. The tools are, are there already developed. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's just a collaborative effort between processor, transporter, producer, state and federal regulatory agencies to to help to sit down and figure this thing out. Um, I know Wisconsin has been doing this for, for several years. Minnesota has been working on secure milk for several years now. Um, but I, I'm telling you, um, these events shake you to your core. Um, and it's really good. It's, it's imperative um, that we, we figure this thing out before the event occurs. Um, I can't stress that enough. Yeah, I guess I'd add to that a little bit, too, as a, a basic biosecurity plan is kind of like a baseline. Um, it's your kind of everyday practice and working those what works for you and in, in your farm and your plant out with your veterinarian and with your um, with your employees and doing some training so everybody is aware of it and understands it. If there's a foreign animal disease in play or if one is close, then that's where I would say that would get ramped up to a whatever you want to call it. A, uh, red, the red plan or the level B, you know, something that's got another, another level of assurance there. I think, oh, I think it's important to remember too that with enhanced biosecurity protocols that would need to be put in place in a disease outbreak, the importance of this is because product and animals move across state lines, the other state veterinarians, Minnesota is going to have to have confidence that we in Wisconsin um, are at the same level, the same standards that they are, and they're going to be willing to accept our product and our animals just like we'll want the, they'll want us to take theirs. So with this um, nationwide system, we're all playing from the same sheet of music. There's the same expectations for everyone. And you had mentioned, too, having this plan consistent and being able to have that trust in your state that they have a plan in place is critical. I mean, we talk a lot about export markets. What happens if those close because of an animal disease? You know, it's a severe concern. So proactively, a collaborative approach is, is what we're trying to, to go with here. So we talk a little bit about um, disease transfer. So Dr. Conkle, would you mention, you know, in the case of foot and mouth disease, what are some of the ways the disease could transfer through movement before we can identify it? What are some, some gaps, we'll mm -hmm. say? 
So foot and mouth disease, like African swine fever and hypathy eye, it's a, it's a very contagious disease. It can move rapidly through animal populations, through susceptible populations. <clears throat> Good news I should mention is that foot and mouth disease is not a human pathogen. Um, so the good news is the milk that's produced by the cow, which could transmit the virus, it can be transmitted in other bodily fluids like saliva and fecal material and so forth. So, and it also survives at temperatures like we're seeing outside today, which is another issue as well. It, it's perfectly happy surviving in cold, wet environments. Um, but the milk produced by the cow is going to be safe for people to drink, especially, when, especially once it's pasteurized. So you might ask yourself, well, then what's the big concern if the milk's a safe product? Why are we so concerned about moving it? Well, the milk can transmit the virus um, up until the time of pasteurization. Pasteurization will kill foot and mouth disease virus. Of course, it was designed to kill lots of other uh, microbes as well, which is good news. But the movement of animals from place to place, uh, movement of milk from place to place could transmit the virus. And it does have a, um, I'd say a medium sized inc incubation period. So that's what causes this issues as well. Animal might be looking perfectly healthy, uh, and in five or seven days, she's gonna break with clinical signs of the disease. But up until that time, she's still capable of transmitting the virus. So there's gonna be a period of time before we detect it in the United States when an infected animals are moving around. All right. Um so at that, we've kind of given you a basic intro. There will be more questions, but I want to open it up to the floor to see if you have any questions. Uh, we've got more, so if we didn't answer them yet, you know, but I want to see if there's any questions and if you feel that your current plan is in good shape or there's opportunities here. Um, we do ask you to come to the mic if you do have a question or if you shout it out, Adam will repeat it. But I will start us off. Um, what would some ideas of biosecurity practices be for the farmers in the room or even processors or others who engage with farmers on a daily basis? I know you said there's a lot of resources on the website, but just to give us a couple ideas or what are some basic things that you think all farms could do tomorrow when they go home? Mm -hmm. I think some basic categories of a good biosecurity plan are one, having somebody in charge of it, whether whether it's an employee or a farm manager who's kind of keeping an eye on that. Also having a written plan, but some of the ideas are as simple as um, having dedicated boots or clothing. So you, your employees that are coming on the farm, any visitors, having them put on dedicated footwear that you can clean and disinfect after, or disposable footwear, so the booties. Uh, booties and gloves, um, maintaining clean areas, um, and that goes for vehicles as well, coming on and off the farm. Good ideas are to, one, um, either limit visitors or know who they are, know who's coming on your premises. Now, obviously, in dairy farms, there's, there's a lot of coming and going, and you probably know your, your AI technician and your feed deliverer and things like that, which is good. Uh, but having the vehicular traffic um, follow a certain pattern so that your feed delivery truck isn't going through animal areas. So they kind of have a de dedicated <clears throat> spot to just get what they need to get done done, and same with milk pickup. So those are some ideas. There, are, I'm sure, and I copy the plan too, there's some others as well, but it can start with being that simple. Um, even across your farm, having um, feed alleyways and, and uh, waters cleaned and disinfected on a regular basis, that's all part of a general good biosecurity plan. What am I missing there? I know I'm missing some things, but just some things to start with. Uh, considerations for infrastructure for your um, premises. Where are your um, dumpsters, trash receptacles? Really thinking about who's coming on and off your premise every day and what other premises they might be coming on and off the same day. Consider in, So if you can move things around, that can help get them away from the areas close to animals. And I don't know about Wisconsin, Minnesota still has rendering. I don't know what you would, but rendering is, um, is a real challenge. Um, it certainly, you know, cow is dead. Um, why is it dead? Um, they, they can carry disease. So um, understanding the rendering process on your farm and maybe restricting movement if you can a little bit or, you know, 
Um, just keeping those things in mind um, should something ever occur. And I think, you know, coming from a processor background, this is an opportunity to work with producers because uh, there weren't as many processors in the room, but you think about your day-to-day -day life, right? You have environmental monitoring programs you have to deal with, people transit through your plants, right? If you're working with a supplier and you have a producer that reaches out, they may reach out for help, do that knowledge transfer, work together to create a better product in the long run and to keep, you know, the food supply safe. Um, but some of the things you had mentioned, I was, I was thinking about some of the things in the plant side that we had to deal with. So um, we talk a little bit about the disease transfer, and I know secure milk supply goes into some talks about sanitation. So very detailed into how do we clean, what are the procedures. So, you know, talking a little bit about sanitation, in Wisconsin and Minnesota, since these two, we work closely together, you know, what are some differences in your program? What have you found over time working with producers and processors, some of the things that had to be, maybe be modified <clears throat> or best practices you've seen? Um, I think, um, I guess I'll start with, for Wisconsin too, some of our challengers in and some of the advantages are, this is such a diverse industry in Wisconsin. We've got everything from, you know, 50 cow dairies to eight, 10,000 cow dairies, um, processors to a great diversity in the number and type of processors. So that's an advantage and it's also a challenge to try to, and it's a moving and shifting landscape. So trying to, to keep track of that has been some of the challenges. And I know Becky's worked with a couple of pilot farms on some of these biosecurity practices, and um, they've taken, they've been good enough to take the information from Secure Web or Secure Milk Supply website and try to put it into practice on their own farms. And they've given Becky some good feedback on what what works, what what needed to be tweaked as well. We've taken the national um, plan template that you'll find on the website. We actually have a Wisconsinized version and it's a little different. The template on the website is a Word document with a lot of extraneous text. You cut and paste, you insert, you delete, um, add things. We've taken it and put it into spreadsheet formats and also put some logic in it. In the national template, too, you're answering the same question a couple of times in different sections. So we've taken that away. So if it, if it asks it, um, you know, on the education page, on the general premise page, it's just going to populate for you. So we've tried to make it a little simpler. And I do have that spreadsheet available. Um, as Dr. Conkle said, I worked with some pilot premises and went through it with them on their farm, um, looked at their layouts, looked at their infrastructure, and looked at the, the information that's required and is gonna be required by other states, um, again, to move product, so that we could simplify it, make it as the least amount of work, make it easy to fill out, and easy to look at if we, and review um, if we do need to issue permits, and we just don't really ever wanna have to do that. <laughs> I'd say one other best practice over the years that we've um, worked with is that for the processors out there, uh, there have been a couple of different processors over the years who've um, done um, what we call probably either a workshop or a tabletop exercise with some of their producers and actually just had a, a drill um, where they set aside a day. Um, one of them, I think, even did it as a non-announced drill with some of their producers having to really make clear that this is just an exercise because we don't want to scare people and make them think it's the real thing unnecessarily. But Becky, for sure, is from a really strong emergency management background, and that's what emergency management relies on is, is practicing, honestly. We do that in our um, office. We practice for these kinds of diseases. We practice simple things like donning and dofting protective gear uh, because if you don't do it every day, um, you need to relearn it. So even something as simple as having to sit down half a day, we call them tabletop exercises because you gather around a table and go through a scenario and, and really get into a few nuts and bolts and say, how would we do this? How would we communicate with our producers? How would we make sure they got the, the messages? And the other important piece, we not only do those exercises, but then we document 
what maybe needs to be improved in our plan? Where did we find some holes? Or, or what new idea did we come up with? And then we make a plan and improve our, pl improve our plans based on that. That's, that's critical. Um, if you just go through the motions, you have to build in that improvement planning process. And we do have some canned exercises that we can um, provide or even possibly help with. I think the biggest thing I heard out of that uh, from the group was we have some tools and they're simple. We don't want, to, you know, <laughs> food industry, they all have recall plans. But when an actual food recall happens, nobody's pulling out the 108 page document. They're looking for a one to two pager that can get them through the process. So as Becky mentioned, there's some check sheets. Secure Milk Supply has some sheets. It's really quick. And is this something that you found you can implement into other programs, like uh, a program a farm already has or a processor already has? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so in some it's cases, easily... it's it, what you've already got in place is a really good start. And you're able, in the, the point of some of these tools on the website, is maybe to have you think of something that you hadn't thought of or, or bring up a category, well, I didn't think about that, or I can't do that right now, but I can work towards that. I can say I've, I've um, borrowed, <laughs> actually stole a lot of these materials from the secure milk supply and the secure food supply plans for some of the disease programs we work with in DACAP um, because they're good general biosecurity measures. Uh, so for instance, our um, program to uh, control PERS and PED in Wisconsin, we've got a rule package that went into place a couple of years ago for uh, swine farms, we used some of these very ideas from the secure food supply plans to, for biosecurity plans for the, the swine farms that they could use because they're simple, easy to understand, easy to use. So I hear two key words. We can integrate it into what we have and it's transferable. So it's not just foot and mouth. It can be used for other diseases. And that's what we're trying to get is these tools that can be <laughs> utilized that you don't have to go and rework the wheel every time there's something new. Um, so any questions at that point? Still got a few more questions, but I'm looking to pull. Perfect, thank you. Okay. Before we answer, to summarize, we're looking at what? National Animal ID Traceability. Is it feasible and do we need to do it? Okay. Mm -hmm. I open it up to the panel. I can start and I'll open it up to the other two as well. I de definitely traceability is, is critical for any, just in general, uh, and certainly during a disease outbreak or during a disease response. That's just one of our main um, critical features that we've, we've gotta be able to do. Um, so USDA and states continue to try to work towards improving our traceability. Um, and we're working towards getting towards uh, radio frequency ID as the, the real official ID, sort of phasing out the news tags, which will help. But working towards on a number of fronts, one, improving our traceability, looking where the gaps are. Um, two, having that be a system that's more electronic and that is where the systems are actually able to integrate together. And definitely, I think states and USDA would welcome support in that endeavor and input. Uh, USDA is actually holding listening sessions right now, I believe, with some of the, the cattle industry on, on the road forward for traceability. Without it, you're dead. It's pure and simple. Quite Thank honestly. you, Mike. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm serious, I, I, can, I can be blunt. Um, um, in the United States, there's a million pigs on the road every day. Um, Minnesota, Iowa is the epicenter of pork production. Um, the pork industry is, re they are on pins and needles right now trying to figure out traceability. They haven't got it figured out yet. Um, God help them, but they, they need to get it figured out. Um, we have to, the incident, I was incident commander through High Path in Minnesota five months of hell. Um, we have got to understand movement in this country. We do not right now. Um, so whatever we can do to move that along, 
Um, we, we have to. We just have to. Um, for, if nothing else, for our trading partners. Um, if we can't prove we're clean or a product coming from a farm is clean, we're not going to get our exports back. Um, you wouldn't believe um, the records that um, Japanese, the Mexicans, the Canadians went through in Minnesota mm -hmm. that we had to prove what had happened just to, just to gain um, our exports back. It, it is just so critical. It, it, I'll leave it at that. And I think to build, and this will be my last comment, those of you that deal with FDA know about the new era of smarter food safety and the push for traceability. So when I went to the meeting in October, the USDA head was there, as well as the CDC. So all three organizations are pushing traceability from a public health standpoint. But we also have consumers that want to know more as well. So it's a balance of do we know what consumers need and then also protecting our farmers and at the same time protecting public health. So it's getting pushed from all different directions, not just regulatory, but some of the things you hear about um, with food recalls, I mean, who's, who's eating romaine lettuce right now? Is anybody really scarfing down romaine lettuce? Okay, whole genome sequencing can find out the farm where it's from and it can tell you what the issue is. So the traceability is important. I think to Mike's point, if you're Salinas, California right now, nobody's buying your lettuce. Even, well, they got the all clear yesterday, so maybe, but there's that perception. And we don't want that, because Wisconsin Dairy and Dairy in general is a well-recognized brand. We don't want those issues. We need to proactively work ahead. So I think that's the key key takeaway here. So, um, I have a question. yes. So if the industry is on pins and needles, and we just talked about how important export markets are, we've depended on that way too much in my opinion. But anyway, so where do we go from here? to move it forward. We've had, originally there was pushback from industry, different industries, that they didn't want to bother with it. It's too hard to put tags and cows that are out on pasture out in Wyoming that see a, see a human once every three months. Uh, how do we progress on this? Because it seems like it's kind of fallen by the wayside, in my opinion. Yeah, I agree, it, it needs to be um, reinvigorated. Um, and like I said, I think the pork industry is, is starting to get a handle on it. Um, you wouldn't believe the movement of pigs. Um, it's just unbelievable. Pigs have got to move, just like milk. They farrow, they're, um, they're weaning every day. Moving pigs, some of these farms are moving pigs every day. So they've got to move just like milk, just like milk, just like eggs. Um, so we've got to have traceability. We got to keep um, chirping, mm -hmm. preaching, um, and I, I do think, you know, African swine fever um, has woken the pork industry like nothing has ever. Even FMD, um, God bid, God forbid, we get FMD now, because, um, hmm. okay. yeah. I think one thing too is, you know, with traceability as well as biosecurity maybe kind of a, a change in perception or a, just a change, a shift in the way we think about those things. Because I think in traceability, and I agree with the comments just made, um, it seems in the past it's always seen as something additional that you have to do, something inconvenient, something more expensive, something that's it's gonna just cause more pain. But in reality, maybe the way to look at it is additional insurance, an additional protection measure um, with both traceability and biosecurity as something that can be done and in some cases with simple steps like we've been trying to emphasize mm -hmm. that offer a lot of value to you on the other side. Yeah, sometimes, perfect. oh, sorry, Mike. Per no, perfect answer. No, perfect. exactly. We want to make things easy and integratable. The biggest issue you run into is interoperability, right? Uh -huh. Somebody wants this program, somebody wants this yeah. program, this software, you've lost all traceability. I mean, you don't know anything about your product at that point. So having a program like this and have it build, it keeps export markets open, 
it keeps your supply chain open and it protects your brand. Your brand is, for a producer, your farm. You're a processor, that's your brand. Any damage to that takes a long time to recover from. So, so I mean, this is a pretty big challenge. It sounds like it has been, and getting some acceptability, getting users uh, to kind of, I don't want to say buy-in, but to find the time. So this sounds like a huge undertaking in some instances. And time, as we know, is a limited commodity. So, you know, where do I really start? Where, what would be my first steps for an action plan? Panel. I think play the what if game, quite honestly. Um, what, if, what if it hits, to, if, you're, if um, a farm in your county is hit with FMD today, what are you going to do, right? Um, there will be a control area established around that infected prem, and any dairy farm in that control area will be quarantined effectively. Um, that, so your farm is affected but not infected, but you're kind of in purgatory, right? So what, are the, what measures can I employ to be able to move milk off my farm? And that's the secure milk supply plant, quite honestly. The moat concept that Dr. Conkle mentioned is perfect. It's a perfect analogy. Um, I, as a dairy farmer, we're in war. You're in war right now. I wouldn't let anybody on my farm. I don't care if it's a dairy inspector or whatever. Um, sorry, I'm being awfully opinionated here, but um, you, 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 have to, you have to treat it that way. Um, why would you let your enemy on the farm? And that enemy is on the boots of anybody coming on your, or the tractor tires or the wheels, anything coming onto your farm, you have to consider infected. What, a, what risk are you willing to accept? Are you willing to accept the feed truck coming onto your farm? If you are, what mitigation factors can you employ to allow that, farm, that truck onto the, maybe a truck wash? Maybe you bring a, um, a big grain um, tender up to the driveway and auger it in, don't let that feed truck on your farm if you can help it. Um, just those things. Just think outside the box a little bit. How can I survive this event without allowing anybody on my farm unless they have, it's critical. So, sorry for preachy, but. So I, I work with some of the dairy inspectors for DATCAP. I will send them to Mike when they show up on <laughs> your farm and they're but, angry. But, no, but again, <laughs> no. Yeah. They, and we it's, can say that because obviously we're, um, this happened in High Path AI too. Our, our inspectors, not in our division, but in the, the agency, we got together with the rest of our agency and said, what are critical things we absolutely have to do because we don't yeah. need people going farm to farm right now until this is under control. So I agree with that entirely. Or, or if, an inspe if somebody does have, they are living by your rules of biosecurity. That's what you have to live with. What, what risk am I willing to accept and how do I mitigate that risk? If something has to come in on my farm, how do I ensure it's clean? That's all I'm saying. Go ahead. It, it, oh, go ahead. I guess, too, I would just recommend um, I can help you with these tools that we have um, to put them in place on your premise. Getting that done ahead of time is going to speed a process for you if you're impacted, um, if you're an affected herd not an infected herd. Um, and also, back to the RFID, um, those electronic records are invaluable in speeding the traceability. Um, that we can prove where animals have moved, um, that you don't have any animals that are traced to an infected herd somewhere else. And, you know, talked a lot about how pigs move, but dairy cattle move too. We've, we all know that. And, the faster we can show where those animals have been that are on your premise or have left your premise, the better position you're in if we have an outbreak. And all joking aside, Mike, they'll just call me. Um, <laughs> they won't call you. Yeah, it won't do what, any good calling me. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, but seriously, if you ever, I, I, well, you know what? Let's go ahead. I'm going to stop talking. I see we have a question. So feel free to. My concern isn't the people driving on my farm. So I think, yeah, mitigation measures for trying to keep species like that away. And I'm thinking more of, I realize probably not the bald eagle, but um, 
rodents, other animals that you want to keep away from buildings and mitigation measures you can do for that. Um, we've worked in the past with USDA Wildlife Services and DNR on mitigation measures for wildlife too. Um, I'll give you an example. We were mortified in High Path. Um, you know, in Minnesota, in Wisconsin probably too, a lot of corn is stockpiled in the fall, right? Outside, uncovered, there were pictures of geese just and gulls just making that pile invi invisible. So we were absolutely mortified. Um, so what are the mid is that a risk? How do you mitigate it? It's a good question. It's a good question. It's a great question, actually. Mm -hmm. So some of these, there, there are no good answers. But we do have partners we can work with to yep. figure it out, to try yep. to figure out better mitigation measures, too. But as, but as long as I keep everybody from driving in and out, I'm still not solving the problem. The problem is without solving the whole problem, mm -hmm. is it worth solving part of the problem? What's the biggest risk? Mm -hmm. Is it the poopy tires coming onto your farm? or a goose flying over? Probably that 500 starlings that visit my feed pile, mm -hmm. that were just at the neighbor's feed pile that were in town yesterday. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's one great thing to think about too for individual premises. What are those number one, number two risks that you wanna be able to address? That's a great, it's a great point. It's thinking outside the box. If I've got a, 500 starlings visiting my feed pile during an FMD outbreak, should I cover that pile? Right? So yes, I think excellent question. And I think anybody up here would be willing to partner with you and to get you more resources on that. Um, with that, I think Lauren is gonna come up and, but, uh, and you know we we've got sorry but we've gone we've had these questions control what you can control right do the best to control what you can control do you have control over starling maybe you don't maybe covering the pile makes a lot of is a bunch of hooey the, the dnr has done some um work on issues like that in the past on premises um, so again, we can connect you with some resources and some ideas, potentially even some help between the Wisconsin DNR and um, USDA Wildlife Services. I did that program, cost me $1,200. We got rid of a few, I said, well, let's do it again, get rid of the other half. Can't only do it once a year. Okay. So $1,200 is a waste of my time. Mm -hmm. Great questions and comments. I don't want to cut it short, but we do have another track session that will start in about five minutes in this room. So we need a little time for all of you to get a quick break and reset the room. But let's give a big round of applause and thank you to Adam and all of our panelists.